right, everybody. Um, sorry I couldn't be with you for class today, but uh, maybe you can uh, sit home and enjoy this, uh, you know, in in uh, in the comfort of your own home instead of coming to class. But hopefully, we'll be able to get uh, all the information across. And uh, if you have any trouble later on trying to do the statics assignment, just send me an email and get in touch, and we'll make sure that you have what you need to answer to answer that assignment. So. Today we're going to talk about uh, vectors, which uh, I guess probably in physics 2211 is probably where you'll do the most with that. Um, and you know, like I've done with a lot of other stuff, I want to you know, spend a lot of time talking about the terminology and the notation and and how you uh, you know how you show show all that sort of thing. So you know, before you get to vectors, we'll talk about scalar quantities. Okay, and so scalar quantity is basically what you're used to. You know, there's a number. Go, that goes along with the scalar quantity. And as I've also been telling you, there's a unit that goes along with it. So, you know, th those units are very important. You know, if you have a number, say 10 here, and if there's no units on it, you don't know what it means. So every time you've got a scalar quantity, there's going to be a value and a unit that goes along with it. Now, usually uh, when we uh, write a, a variable name for a scalar quantity, we use italics here, okay? And so, uh, you know, when you're writing on your pen and paper, you can't really write italics. It just looks like an F. Um, but at least when you're producing things in word processing, then uh, you can, you know, use, you want to use the italics. And that helps us to know that it's a variable name rather than just regular text. Of course, the, uh, the unit is not going to be italicized uh, when, when you're writing that next to your value. So that's a scalar, regular number, and it has units that go along with it. Okay. Um, then we have vector quantities, and essentially a vector quantity tells you, you know, not, not you know, all the stuff that a scalar has, but tells you in what direction something is. You know, so if you have a ball, for example, and you're kicking that ball, you're going to impart some force to that ball, and you know whether you push it, you know, in which direction you push it will change where it goes. You know, if you you know, if it's sitting on the floor and you push on it downwards, it's not going to move because it's going to, you know, be pushed into the ground and not move. If you kick on the side, it's going to, you know, move in whatever direction you kicked it. So obviously when we're talking about engineering type quantities, it will make a difference not just, you know, how much it is and what the unit are that we use to measure it, but in what direction it is applied. Now that can be true for forces, it can be true for velocities, accelerations. Even, even um, you talk about a displacement. If I move, you know, five meters, it, you know, we want to know what direction is that. Is that north? Is it south? Is it east or is it west? It would make a difference. Now, usually when we talk about vector quantities, we write them in bold, okay? Not italicized, but in bold. And again, you know, when you're writing this on your paper, it's kind of hard to show that something's a bold face. And that's why another way that we can write, um, we can write vector quantities is with an arrow over top of the quantity. And so that's how you're going to want to represent a vector quantity when you put, uh, when you're writing it on paper, you'll put an arrow, okay? Um, now, you know, you want to make sure just like that units match, that if you, you can't say that 140 pounds mass is equal to 140 pounds force, you also want to make sure that both sides of an equation match in terms of being scalar or vector quantities. You can't set a vector quantity equal to a scalar. That's just mathematically not accurate. So whenever you're writing your vector quantity, it obviously has to have a value and it has to have units and it also has to have direction. And there's several different ways that you can indicate direction. Sometimes in very simple cases we might talk about the cardinal directions, you know, north, south, east, west, or you know, in this, you know, usually an up arrow means north. Sometimes we use that, but uh, you know, that's not as specific as we might want to have. Uh, so that's not so common uh, in engineering. Uh, another way is with a unit vector. This is basically, you know, we'll talk more about this later, but basically, you know, this is a way of encoding what is the direction I'm talking about. Um, more commonly, maybe in high schools, you might use an angle that you'll say it's 10 newtons and it's at an angle of 90 degrees. Um, you know, you may, may have seen that sometime. Um, but in your courses, especially in statics and the other mechanics courses, using this, this uh, unit vector is going to be the way that we're going to use it most. And we'll talk about sort of the differences between these two and why uh, we like to use these unit vectors. 
Okay, now one thing we often talk about with, uh, with a vector is what its magnitude is or its size, okay? And so if I have a vector f, bold means, you know, means it's a vector, we'll use the symbols of an absolute value sign, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute why, why that kind of makes sense as the absolute value sign. But the absolute value sign takes a vector and it turns it into a scalar. Basically, it, it takes away direction. You, know, you get rid of this direction and whatever's left, you know, this, the value and the unit, okay, the scalar part of that vector, that's what's left when you take the absolute value. And so, um, and, and usually we'll match up the symbols. If we use a capital bold F for the vector, we'll use a capital italics F to represent its magnitude. And so that's sort of a standard thing. You know, you might see, you know, a bold face F and then immediately you'll see a, an italics F and that's talking about the, the magnitude of, of the vector F. Okay. Now, we can also talk about, you know, if, if we have a, a way with this absolute value symbol to rip away the scalar part of the vector, we might also want a symbol to be able to rip away the vector part of the vector. And so you might see this, again, it's not all that common, um, but you might see this little angle symbol before the F, and basically that rips away whatever the angle is. You know, in this case, it would be, you know, 90 degrees, okay? Um, now, of course, uh, you know, angles are actually better represented in terms of radians. I'm sure all of your uh, math professors have told you that uh, you know, radians are better than degrees. Um, and that's true. Uh, and uh, obviously, you, know, you all know that there's two pi radians in 360 degrees. Now, technically, you know, I wrote it here not with an equal sign, but with this value, with just writing in. Technically, it's not true to say these two things are equal. And again, it boils down to sort of real nitty-gritty uh, you know, technicalities on the units. And this is the reason why mathematicians don't like to use degrees, because technically degrees is, um, you know, is defined in a different way than radians. And degrees are, are basically measured as a fraction of a rotation. You know that there's 360 degrees in a rotation, and 90 degrees is you know one fourth of those 360 degrees. So degrees are technically defined as you know what fraction of a rotation, and radians are actually defined in a different way. Okay, and the way radians are defined is if I want to know the angle in radians of some angle here theta, what I need to do is I need to find its chord length s. And, it's, and the radius of the circle that that chord is on, and I, if I take the ratio of those two things, then that's gonna tell me how many radians I have for this angle. Now, S is measured in distance, and R is measured in distance, so this S over R is a dimensionless number. The, the, you know, the length units here are gonna cancel the length units there, and that's by its definition, a radian is a dimensionless quantity, which is technically different than a, than a degree that, you know, with that degree symbol, it's what fraction of a rotation it is rather than this ratio of two length units. Okay, so that's one sort of, you know, justification for why, you know, why radians are technically better than using angles. You know, so one degree is defined as one three hundred sixtieth of a rotation, and a rotation is not a dimensionless thing. Okay, so um, one way we can look at this, if we look at um, you know this rotation, you know a full rotation all the way around, that's going to be you know the s having to do with one rotation is the perimeter. Okay, and if we want to know how many radians there are in a rotation by this definition of what a radian is, then we need to take the perimeter of the circle and divide by the radius of the circle, and that will give us. Uh, what 360 degrees is. Now, of course, the perimeter is pi times the diameter, and the diameter is 2 times the radius. And so you can see here, with our definition of what a radian is, the r divides out, and you can see that one full rotation around the circle by the definition we've made for a radian gives us 2 pi radians. So that's where the 2 pi comes from. That's why there's 2 pi radians in, in uh, 360 degrees. Okay. So that's a little uh, you know, sidebar on, on where the radians came from and why they're preferred over degrees. Okay? Now, let's say I've got this vector A. 
And oftentimes we're going to write a vector uh, on a page where you know we'll scale however long it is depending on its magnitude. So if its magnitude is big, we'll draw it long. And then you could come up with some scaling. Let's say this vector is supposed to represent 10 newtons. And so we can say, okay, well that's what that looks about two inches. So you know every you know 10 newtons is is uh, two inches. You know, so we would draw this vector to be longer depending on how big its magnitude is. Okay? And then obviously the direction here is going to tell us you know, what is its angle. So if we measure 0 from the horizontal, you know, then this angle right in here would be the angle of A. So the magnitude of A would be its length. This is a scalar quantity because I'm using the absolute value. Okay, and then as I was talking about before, this angle here is the angle of A. So by drawing this arrow on the page, we can get an idea about how long it is relative to other vectors, and we can see what its angle is. So instead of writing down, you know, 10 newtons at an angle of 40 degrees, we can visually represent this with with the uh, with the arrow. So we'll call the the arrow head here. We call that the head. Okay and the tail is the beginning part of, of the vector. So just a little bit of terminology. Um, also, we can talk about the line of action a vector is. Sometimes in statics class, you'll talk about being able to move a vector along its line of action, and it doesn't affect uh, the motion of, of what might be caused. Uh, so that's another uh, terminology you'll see. Okay. Now, um, you know, Recall, you know, we talk about a, a scalar quantity using a um, using a an italic value, and we talk about using bold for vector quantities. Now, this little a, I'm not talking about the magnitude of big A. Okay, if I want, if I was going to use the standard notation for the magnitude of the vector a, I would use a uppercase italics a. Okay, so this this little a here is has nothing to do with the big A. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe I should have picked a different a different letter just to be you know really clear that it's they're not connected. Okay, but uh, if we have some scalar little a and some vector big A, and it turns out there's an identity here. If we take the if we take big A and multiply it by a scalar and then take the magnitude. Okay, so basically, this is multiplying vector a with something. Let's say a is a scalar that's 2. Okay, and so by taking big A and multiplying it by 2, that's, that's essentially going to make that vector twice as big. Okay, and what this identity says is that if I take the absolute value of little a, which means the same thing that you're used to, okay, that's talking about, you know, if it's positive, you keep a, and if it's negative, you get rid of the negative sign, okay. And then here we've got the absolute value. Well, not really that, but what's the magnitude of big A? Okay. So if we first take the magnitude of big A, we take the absolute value of A and multiply those things together. It's the same thing about as first multiplying the, the, the scalar and the vector together and then taking the magnitude. Okay. So you know this you know that's one of the things that you guys will need to start getting comfortable with is to be able to look at an at a mathematical equation and understand what it means okay and so i'm going to explain you know you're going to look at this and be like wow that doesn't make any sense to me okay but now i'm going to explain it in a different way using this visual representation of the vectors and it's going to make sense okay and so what's really kind of amazing and beautiful about mathematics is that you know there's a lot of information boiled down into this equation and we don't actually you know if you understand the mathematics and the notation you actually don't have to explain it in another way and so once you get comfortable using the mathematical notation then you're going to be able to get a lot of information about using that notation and it takes a while to get comfortable with that um, so I'm going to go ahead and explain this in a different way so if this is our vector a okay our big a bold big bold a Okay, and let's say my scalar little a happens to be 2, like I was talking before. And if I'm going to multiply big A by 2, it's going to make it twice as big. So this is my original A, and this A here is twice as long as that one. I basically extend that vector to be twice as big as it originally was. Now you notice that the angle here has not changed. I haven't changed the angle by multiplying by a scalar, because a scalar only has a value. It doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have um, any angle in it. So the when I, this 2a and a have the same direction, but 
2a is twice as big. And that's what this equation really means, OK? If I take the original size of a, multiply it by 2, that's the same thing as taking the magnitude of this thing, at, you know, having multiplied it by 2 first, OK? Now, this little a scalar could be a negative number. It could be negative 1, for example, OK? And so if I take negative 1 times a, what that does, it does two things. First of all, it scales it by 1. Well, if I multiply anything by 1, it doesn't change it. Okay? So that's why the size of these two vectors, their magnitudes are the same. Okay? But the minus sign actually changes its direction. It sort of moves. You know, you, That makes sense. If I'm walking north and suddenly I multiply myself by negative 1, I negate what I'm doing by walking north, that means I should walk south. Okay, and so essentially, you know, by multiplying by a negative number, it changes the direction of the vector by 180 degrees. Okay, now again, when I take the magnitude, it strips away the direction. So um, I don't, you know, when I'm looking at, you know, how big is this vector relative to that one, the direction doesn't matter. It's only the size, and that's why I'm taking the absolute value of little a. I don't care whether this was negative one or positive one. All I know is I want to multiply the magnitude by one, which doesn't change it, obviously, in this case. Okay. So here we can start seeing a little bit about why we're also using the absolute value symbol to take the magnitude of A. Okay? Because remember, taking the magnitude of A is going to give me the length of the vector. And it basically strips away the angle. I basically ignore the angle when I take the magnitude. And that's essentially what the absolute value for a scalar does. It strips away the sign. I mean, in some ways, you know, a scalar can have a direction. Even it, either it can be in the positive direction or it can be in the negative direction in, in some sense. So the absolute value symbol, whether I'm using it on a scalar or whether I'm using it on a vector, it strips away what the uh, it strips away what the uh, what the direction is, and that's sort of why we use that absolute value symbol. Okay, now. I could multiply by a scalar negative 1.5. And here we'll notice, yeah, the direction has changed 180 degrees. It's gone in the opposite direction. And now this vector is 50% longer than this vector because I have multiplied it by a factor of 1.5. Okay? Um, I could also have a scalar that's less than 1. It could make the vector smaller. So this vector here is half the size of the original vector. Okay? So that's multiplying a vector by a scalar or vector scaling. Okay? Now, we might want to add two vectors together. Okay? And we're going to write, you know, the, the vector a plus the vector b is going to give me the vector r. Now, this is a, a normal notation we use where that r stands for the resultant of adding together vectors a and b. Now, what does it mean to add vectors a and b? I mean, we understand what it means to add 2 plus 2. Okay, but what does it mean to add two vectors? Sometimes these vec you know, when I, we use these mathematical symbols on vectors, sometimes they mean something that makes sense for us, and sometimes it might mean something different. We have to think about what it means to add vector one, vector a, and vector b. So, let's say we have these two vectors a and b, and let's say they represent you walking a certain distance in some direction. So, let's say you walked this distance in that direction. OK, well, well, I guess if we're going to talk about a plus b, we should start with a. So let's say we start here at the tail. And it's like we walk this amount. Well, here's my cursor. Let's say we walk this amount in that direction. And then after we do that, let's say we walk the, same, the, you know, the amount of b in the direction that b is pointing. OK, that first I walk the amount in the direction of a, and then I walk the amount in the direction of b. What is the total amount that I have walked? Or what is the result, result or resultant of me walking first in the direction and amount of a, and then the direction and the amount of b? OK, and that's the idea of adding together a plus b. OK, and there's actually two ways we can look at this. We can look at it by putting the vectors tail to tail, or we can look at putting the vectors head to tail. And this way makes us think more about you know, walking. First, I walk in the direction of A and the amount of A, and then I walk in the direction of the amount of B. And the resultant is from where I started at to where I ended at. 
okay? And so the resultant vector is not adding the distances A and B, but adding the distances combined together with the directions. So it's a little bit different than adding things together you know, with scalars because it has to take the, ve the vector part, the, the angle part, in, into effect. Okay? So this way here, tail to tail is a little less, um, a little bit less intuitive than the A, you know, doing the head to tail one. But you notice it does basically the same, same thing. If I put these things tail to tail, essentially I make this parallelogram where the resultant is the diagonal of the parallelogram. And when I do things head to tail here, really I, I have a triangle, which is really just one half of the parallelogram. So both things give you the same, same result, and it all depends on which way you like to look at it, you know, of, of which one uh, you want to use. They, they're, they're basically the same thing. Okay? And of course, um, if we look at the triangle construction, there's a top triangle and there's actually a bottom triangle. And the top triangle gets you to the same place that the bottom triangle does. If I follow that one, I get the same place as if I follow this one. And what we've just shown here is by looking at this graphically, we've basically proven that vector addition is commutative. It doesn't matter wh whether we add A plus B or B plus A, we'll end up in the same place. Okay, So that's what's really fascinating. By the, by the way of, of we've defined this vector addition, it turns out that it's commutative, just like scalar addition is. Okay, So vector addition is commutative, just like scalar addition. Okay, So that's commutative. Now, there's a very special case involved here with vector addition. What if A and B had the same direction? What if they were pointing in the same direction? And if they were pointing in the same direction, it would be very easy to add them together because if I put them head to tail here, they point in the same direction and the resultant would just be the distance of traveling along A and B. Okay, And so in this special case, when these vectors are what we call collinear, when they have the same direction, the resultant vector of adding together A and B has the magnitude, the magnitude of the resultant vector is the same as adding the, direct, the, the, uh, the magnitudes of A and B together. Now these two equations are very, very different. Okay, this one over here adds the vectors together, and this one adds the, the, um, the magnitudes of the vectors together. This is a scalar equation, this is a vector equation. And only in this special case, when the vectors are collinear, is this equation true when I add two vectors together. Okay, so look for example here. If I add the magnitude of A, Sorry about seeing my email uh, notifications there. Um, if I look at the magnitude of A and the magnitude of B, the sum of those two vectors' magnitudes is longer than the resultant's magnitude. The magnitude of A plus the magnitude of B is greater than the magnitude of R under almost all circumstances of adding vectors together. The only time that that's true, that the magnitude of the two vectors equals the magnitude of the resultant, is when they're collinear. Okay? And so it's very easy to do this vector addition. I just add the magnitudes of the two things together to get the magnitude of R. And obviously, R has the same direction as both A and B do. Okay? So this vector addition is very easy. And this thing right here, this, this special case of adding vectors together, is the whole reason why we use unit vectors to represent our, our vectors. Okay? And we'll talk more about that later. Okay. What would we do to do vector subtraction? What if we wanted to take vector A and subtract the vector B and get a resultant? Now you notice I used a little prime symbol on here. What does that mean? Okay. Now prime is another, you know, this this prime or this little this little um, dash here. It's a standard thing that we use in a lot of notations, and actually it can mean two different things. And it's kind of like if I say bear, you don't know if I'm talking about the animal bear or whether I'm talking about being bear that that, that there's nothing covering it. Okay? In the same way, that prime can mean two different things. In this case, what it means is it means something a little bit different than R, but related. 
You know, so you'll remember here I used r as the resultant of adding two vectors together. What I'm trying to represent here with r prime is that it's something similar to the resultant vector but a little different. And so it's the resultant of doing something to two vectors, but it's going to be the resultant of subtracting them rather than adding them. That's what I mean in this case when I'm using this prime. Okay? The other thing it could mean uh, when you get into calculus, it could mean the, the, um, the derivative of r with respect to distance. Okay? So that's not what I'm talking about, but you might see r primes um, in other, other places where it's talking about taking the derivative of r with respect to distance. Don't worry about that, but it is important to know that that prime can be used to mean two different things, and you're going to need to use your context to know which one it is. So let's say I wanted to take A and subtract B. Well, I already know that multiplying, you know, I, I, you know, I can sort of factor out that multiplication. We, you know, we know when we do regular subtraction that we could add the negative of whatever that second thing is. Okay, and we can do that in vector subtraction as well. And we know, we already know how to multiply b by a negative 1. That's a scalar. We know what happens when we multiply b by negative 1. That changes its direction. Its size doesn't change, but it changes and points the other way. And so now I know how to add a and another vector. I just put them tail, you know, head to tail or tail to tail. I do the triangle or the parallelogram. So I need to do the triangle or the parallelogram on a and negative b. Okay, I can do either one, doesn't matter. Okay, and that's going to give me a resultant that goes to here. Okay, so by defining what vector addition is, and by, ve by defining what scalar multiplication is, now I can figure out how to subtract a vector from another vector. So that's kind of interesting that, you know, based on the things we already know, we can figure out how to do vector subtraction. Okay. So we've talked about how to multiply a vector by a scalar. We've talked about how to add two vectors together. And we've talked about how to subtract two vector, a uh, vector from another. So let's do now the opposite of vector addition. Let's start with a resultant. And let's say what two vectors add together to give r. So this is the opposite of vector addition. So what two vectors add together to give r? Okay, and if you sit down and think about that a little while, if we were in class, I would ask you guys to give me some, uh, you know, some ideas about what two vectors add together to R. And as it turns out, there's actually an infinite number of vectors that can add together to give R. Okay, I mean, one case is the vector that goes from here to here, and then the vector that goes from here to here. Those two add together to give R. The vector that goes from here to here and the vector that goes from here to here also add together to give r. Those are two vectors. There's actually an infinite number of collinear vectors that could add together to give r. Okay? But there's actually an infinite number of other vectors too that are in other directions. So when somebody poses this question and says, you know, what two vectors add together to give r, the smart person says, oh, that's a trick question because there's an infinite number of them. Okay? And so oftentimes when somebody asks this question, they'll specify something more and say, I want the resultant, I want what two vectors add together to give this resultant, but I want them to fall on these two lines of action. That I want a vector that's in this direction to add together to give r, and I want to add it to a vector that lies in this line of action. And in this case where you give the resultant vector and you give the two lines of action, there actually is a unique combination of vectors a and b that add together to give r. Okay? And to, do, to find out that, we need to draw a parallelogram where this is the diagonal and these are two sides on the parallelogram. That parallelogram gives me the resultant. Okay? So either I can go like this and this, or I can go like this and this. But really, they're the same two vectors, a and b. If I add together a and b, they will give me r. Okay, so I can take, you know, I've, I've take this vec, this resultant vector r, and I've resolved it. Again, that's the terminology we use. We've done the resolution of r into its components a and b. Okay. And so this is, like I said, the opposite of addition. I've taken the result of the addition and given what the two things add together to give. Okay, So um, again, there's an infinite number of results, and you need to be 
told what the lines of action are in order to get um, the unique set of the vectors that add together to give r. Now, why might we want to know this? Okay, so let's say we've got some cable here, and let's say we yank up on this cable with some force, 100 newtons, 200 newtons, whatever it happens to be. Okay, we might want to know how much of that force that I'm pulling up on there ends up going in these directions on these cables. So if I know the directions of the cables, I can use this method here of knowing what is the total force being pulled up here to be able to resolve that total force, Fc, into its components Fa and Fb. Then I could get what those two forces are to know what the tensions are in each of these cables. So there's an example of when we might want to resolve a vector into its components. And as it turns out, um, this, this idea of resolving a vector is going to be very, very helpful. OK. All right. So those are the vectors that we would get. Now, what if we wanted to add a bunch of vectors together? We've got these vectors 1, 2, and 3. We wanted to add them all together. What if we had 10 vectors, 20 vectors we wanted to add together? How would we go ahead and do that? OK. Well. Essentially, you know, if we write this in a mathematical equation, we want to add together all of these vectors and get what the resultant vector is. Okay? And now, another piece of notation here, we're putting a subscript on that. Okay? Because we like to use the vector f to represent a force. And in statics, that's, you're going to do tons and tons of forces that have to do with forces when you get to statics. And so it's nice to use the symbol f to represent a force. It reminds us that it's going to have force units. And so to represent what each individual force is, we'll put a subscript on there anyway. So I can see all four of these things represent forces. But that's the first force I want to add, the second force, the third force. And this is the resultant force. That's why I put an r as the subscript. So again. That's a sort of typical way that we use the notation to help convey information when we see the equations. So if I wanted to get this answer for fr, okay, I would need to add, you know, we have no way of knowing yet how to add three vectors together, okay, but we do know how to add two vectors together, and we know that addition is commutative. It doesn't matter which order we do it, so we can just pick any two of these vectors to add together. So, well, it makes logical sense. We might just go ahead and, and add the first two vectors together. Well, we know how to do that. Okay. Um, if we take all of our vectors and put all of their tails together, okay, we can first look at f1 and f2. We just need to draw the parallelogram that has f1 and f2 as its sides, and then draw the diagonal. That gives me f1 plus f2. Okay. Now all of these vectors are still all have their their they're all have their tails together. And if I want to add now f1 plus f2 and add that to f3, I need to make a parallelogram with this as a side and this as a side. And then I need to find the diagonal there. That gives me the resultant after I've added f1 and f2 together, and then it added f3 to the result. Ah, hold on. Don't want to move on yet. OK, so essentially, if I want to add a whole bunch of vectors together, I just add them one, one at a time. OK, and it's pretty straightforward. So you know, this process of how do you add vectors together, it makes sense. You just, draw, you just draw parallelograms, and then you find the diagonal. And I mean, if you had a ruler, you could measure it. And you could have your protractor, and you could measure the angles. I mean, that's not going to be especially exact. It would be nice for us to mathematically be able to calculate that. Okay, but at least the concept is pretty simple of how to do this vector addition. Okay, now mathematically, how you do solve this, you need to deal with triangles, and you're going to know things about sides. You're going to know things about angles, and essentially, it's going to come down to using the sine, the law of sines, and the law of cosines to be able to figure out the lengths and the angles of these triangles that make up half of the parallelograms that we're drawing together. So anybody that's done your trigonometry class knows that you really hate this part of the class when you do the law of sines and the law of cosines. There's all this calculation. You have to keep track of everything. What angle is opposite of the other sides? And it's a big mess, right? You guys, I mean, anybody that's been intrigued knows you know, doing this stuff is painful. It's not hard, necessarily. I don't know. I would say it's straightforward. It's formulaic, really. You know, you just have to apply the same thing over and over again. But imagine adding 10 vectors together, one after another, using the law of sines and the law of cosines. It gets pretty annoying. It would be really nice if there was a better way to do this. Okay? And there is a better way to do this. Okay? So let's look at our vector f. Before we called it r, I'm going to call it f because we might be thinking about a force. And let's say we wanted to resolve this into its components. Okay, the two vectors that add together to give f. 
Now, as you remember, there's an infinite number of vectors that add together to give f, okay? But there will be a unique combination if we choose what the lines of action are. Now, what would happen if we chose those lines of action to be perpendicular to one another? Okay, well, there's, I mean, that's going to give a valid way of adding together two vectors to give f. But as it turns out, adding them perpendicular to one another will help us. Okay. Now again, notation. Instead of, you know, before I chose a and b to define my lines of action, here I defined x and y. You know, usually x and y we talk about as Cartesian coordinates where those directions are perpendicular to one another. So now when I'm talking about perpendicular lines of action, it makes sense for me to talk about x's and y's. Okay. Now, this, these x and y, they don't have to be horizontal and vertical. I could rotate that somewhat if I wanted to. Um, you know, but as the, the important thing is I need to make sure that x and y are perpendicular. But of course, we're used to thinking about x being horizontal and y being vertical. So we might as well go ahead and draw them that way uh, just so that they you know, match with what we're used to. So the question is, what vector in the direction of x adds to a vector in the direction of y that adds together to give f? And what we need to do is draw a parallelogram where this is one side, and this is the other side, and this is the diagonal. Now, I purposely said parallelogram because we're talking about parallelograms. And anybody that looks at that shape says, that's not a parallelogram. Well, technically it is. Technically, it's a parallelogram that has right angles for its sides. But that is a rectangle. Okay, A rectangle is a special case of a parallelogram. And we all know that dealing with rectangles actually is easier than dealing with, uh, with, with parallelograms. And what's nice is if I want to relate the, si the lengths of these sides to each other, I use the Pythagorean theorem instead of the law of sines and cosines. And if I want to know the angles here, well, this one's obviously 90 degrees. Okay? If I want to know how these angles relate to the lengths of the sides of the triangles, I don't have to use the law of cosines. I can just use sine, cosine, and tangent. Okay, now those of you that haven't gotten to trigonometry yet, don't be worried about this. Uh, we'll, we'll, um, you're going to get to that when you're in trigonometry. Hopefully, somebody on your team that is going to help you, that you're going to all work together on this statics assignment. Hopefully, somebody on your team has taken trigonometry or is in it now. And if not, come into my office and I'll help you with help with this, this assignment. Okay, but those that have had trigonometry know that you can relate the angles of these uh, of of in the triangle of this right triangle to the lengths of the sides with opposite and adjacent and hypotenuse and all of those things that define the trig function sine, cosine, and tangent. And using sine, cosine, and tangent are much, much easier than using the law of sines and cosines. This is much more complicated. So if, when we resolve our vectors, we choose the lines of action to be perpendicular to one another, we get rectangles instead of parallelograms, and it makes our lives easier because we can work in, in uh, trig functions instead of the line, law of sines and cosines. Okay? So if I write this as a vector equation, this vector plus that vector equals the big F vector f. Okay? I can also say you know, the, the magnitude of f in the x direction it, you know, it, that is going in, to the right in the x direction. And the magnitude in the y direction has a direction up. You know, I could write them equivalently. Obviously, this is a lot longer. Um, but we could write it the magnitude of fx going to the right, the magnitude of fy going up. Okay. Eventually, we'll start talking about unit vectors, and, and we'll get rid of those arrows. Okay. So let's say we had this new vector f. And I'm putting a prime on there to say, well, this is kind of like this f, but different, because it has a different magnitude, and it's pointing in a different direction. So I'm going to handle it slightly differently. Okay. But let's say I wanted to uh, resolve this vector into, the x and, into x and y coordinates. And here I've given an example where x and y aren't drawn horizontally and vertically. Maybe there's some slope that goes along this direction, and it might be useful for me to, to talk about that direction. Okay, So let's say I want to take this vector f, and I want to resolve it into the x and y components in the x and y directions. I need to draw its, its rectangle, because of course it's still going to give a rectangle, because x and y are uh, perpendicular to one another. 
okay? And if I write what the vector equation is adding these two things together, okay, I get basically the same equation, just that I got primes on there because this is a different case than, than this one, okay? But we'll notice one thing, okay? We'll notice one thing, that Fy, the vector component in the y direction, is pointing the opposite direction of y. Okay? And this is something that we're going to need to handle. We're going to need to manage this of what's going on with that direction. And we're not going to worry about that right now, um, but we'll, we'll handle that a little bit more later when we get to the, this idea of the, of the um, uh, unit vectors. So let's go back to F here. And we're going to resolve it into its components. And I might want to write that in terms, you know, I'm going to have that in its x component and its y component. And one of the things that's going to help us is to talk about the units vec unit vectors i and j. Okay, and I don't know, I'm not sure what math class you start talking about unit vectors i and j. I guess maybe in calculus, certainly by calc 3, but I'm, I'm sure you see that in physics as well. Okay, and so when we talk about um, unit vectors, one of the things we'll often do is we'll make them be lowercase instead of uppercase, okay? And actually, to be completely technically correct, we will put a little hat on top of it, okay? A little carrot, sometimes it's called a carrot or a hat, okay? And anytime we talk about unit vectors, we should put a hat on top of it, but we talk about unit vectors i and j that point in the x and the y directions so often that we get annoyed putting a hat on top of them, and so oftentimes they'll get dropped off. So if we're talking about a unit vector, that unit vector could be any direction. It could be pointing this way. It could be pointing that way. It could be pointing that way. So unit vectors can point in any direction. But when those unit vectors happen to point along in the directions of the primary axes, x and y in this case, we often drop the hat off of them. And we always call the unit vector in the x direction i. And we always call the unit vector in the y direction j. Okay, And so there's a couple properties about i and j. The first of them is that they have, that their magnitudes, their lengths, are equal to 1. Okay, Another thing that's important with them is that they are dimensionless. That, that 1 here, the unit that comes along with that is nothing. Just like a radian technically has no units, a unit vector has no units. F here, if I take the magnitude of F, that's going to be in units of force. It's going to be 100 newtons or 200 newtons or 500 pounds force or whatever. Okay? The magnitude of F will have units, but the magnitudes of unit vectors do not have units. And the size is 1, and there's no units on that. Okay? So what's important about I and J, these unit vectors, because they have a magnitude of 1 and because they have no units, if I multiply a, a, a scalar times that vector, basically what I get is a new vector that has the magnitude of f that doesn't change by multiplying it by i because i has a size of 1. So I don't change the size. This fx does not get scaled. But essentially, I add to the scalar f of x, I add to it the direction of i. So when I multiply the scalar f of x times i, essentially I've got the magnitude of the vector here in fx because i has a magnitude of 1, and I have the direction of the vector here built into the unit vector. So the unit te vector tells me which direction, but it doesn't add any size, whereas the scalar I multiply it by gives me the size. Okay? So I can write this vector f, the resultant of adding this vector to this vector, as the size of the x component times the vector in the, x, the unit vector in the x direction plus the size of the, this vector in the vertical direction times the unit vector in the vertical direction. Okay? So let's go back to this f prime case. Okay? In this f prime case, I have the size of this vector f prime of x italic, not bold, and the size of this vector as f prime of y, italicized, not bold. Now, this vector is moving in the i direction. It's pointed in the i direction. This vector is not pointed in the j direction. It's actually pointed in the negative j direction. So when I build this vector from the magnitude and the unit vector, I need to multiply it by the negative version of the unit vector. So I'm going to 
add the x component to the y component, but the direction of the y component is in the negative j direction. So this is the technically correct way of adding things together. Okay, but because of the com commutativeness of multiplying of, of multiplying things here, we can actually rewrite this equation equivalently to be this vector minus this vector. Now, what is this vector? F of y in the j direction. Ignore that minus sign for for a minute and just look at this piece. That's something that's this that's this long, but not pointed this way. Pointed this way. So this vector right here without the minus sign is this vector. And I need to subtract that from this vector to get f. Okay. Now, this is the way we almost always write it in our mechanics classes. But this is the way to really think about it. That it's not that minus sign doesn't actually belong to the magnitude. The minus sign belongs to the direction. And that's important because if I take the magnitude of a vector, remember it scales away the, the direction. It's only the size. So the size of the vector f is the same as the size of the vector negative f. Basically, that magnitude, that, that, that uh, absolute value, takes away the angle. Okay. So like I said, we always write it like this minus sign. But technically, you can never have a negative magnitude of a vector, but it's just in the opposite direction. So that's one of the things you just have to think about and make sure that you manage that when you get in your statics class to manage those si signs, to really think about that, that it's in the other direction. OK, so now we're getting to the final piece of why this, uh, you know, using, this, using that collinear piece and using these uh, 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 Cartesian coordinates where the lines of action are perpendicular. Now we're going to get to be where things are really powerful. So let's say I wanted to take these three vectors, f1, f2, and f3, and add them. We already showed how we could do that using the parallelogram stuff, but we'd have to use the law of sines and cosines, which is a pain. So let's do that now where I'm going to resolve these vectors into their horizontal and vertical, or x and y coordinates. So each one of these vectors, I need to break into its horizontal and vertical components. Okay, so each one of the dashed vectors are the original forces, and I need to resolve them into their horizontal and vertical components. Now, f1, if I take this f1, I can break it into its x piece and its y piece, just like I can break f2 into its x piece and its y piece. Now, f1 here, both the x and the y components are pointing in the positive directions, whereas f2 here, the y component's pointing in the positive direction, but the x component is pointing in the negative direction. So we need to have a minus sign on there. Okay? And then we also have f3. It has its x piece plus its y piece. And in this case, the x part is in the positive direction, but its y part is in the negative direction. Technically, that should be negative j, and this should be negative i. But usually, we put the minus signs out front because it makes it looks cleaner and it's easier for us to understand. Now, how do I add f1, f2, and f3 together without using the law of sines and law of cosines? And we're going to use this idea of the collinearness. Okay, these three vectors right here, the vertical components of the three vectors are all pointing in the same direction just like the horizontal components of the three vectors are pointing in the same direction. So it's easy to get the magnitude of adding these three things together. I just add together their components. Okay, And so to get the resultant vectors x component, I need to add together all three of these magnitudes. This takes no trigonometry. I just need their magnitudes, and I just they're all scalars. So I add them or subtract them as necessary to get the magnitude of the vector f, the fr. Okay? And in the same way, I do the same thing for, for the y's. Now, there's no trigonometry involved here. But to go from the dashed vectors to these, I do need sines and cosines to be able to get that. I don't need the law of sines and the law of cosines, just a regular sine and cosine. 
Um, and I'm going to go ahead and record also an example of how to do this so that you can get an idea of working out the details because right now I'm just talking you know in equations and I haven't done the details and, and you'll want to see that but I'll, I'll record one, that for you too so and, and that'll be coming all right so I've got my vector here I know how big its x component is and I know how big its y component is I might want to know then okay what is its magnitude okay and what is its angle Okay, now in order to get the components, I just sum together all of the x pieces and sum together all of the y pieces to get the x and the y components. But if I wanted to know what is the overall magnitude of fr, I can't add these two things together because they're not in the same direction. Okay, I, uh, and I might want to know what that sum is when I, you know, what the magnitude is, and I, like I said, I can't sum them, and I might want to also know its angle. Okay, now I can use the Pythagorean theorem to be able to take the two angles, I'm sorry, the two lengths here, and take the square root of the sum of the squares to get the resultant's magnitude. Okay, that's, you know, using the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, now if I want to know the angle, I can take the inverse tangent of the vertical component over the horizontal component. And again, you'll need some trigonometry, and basically you just need to look at what the definition of tangent is, and that'll fall out for you. Okay? So, um, that's pretty much what I've got now for, uh, for the sort of the theory behind this. Um, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to go ahead and I will uh, record for you an example of working this out, and you'll get to see how this works um, you know, in, in practice. So thanks for listening, and uh, send me some emails or drop by my office if you have any questions, and we'll um, get going on that stacks assignment. Uh, like I said, I'll also be posting an example to get you going.